start. So hello everybody. This is Chiron Talks again, the last of 15 episodes in this series. Seven, um, this is the 17th. Well, time passes, uh, time flies, and um, we are together again with Dominic. Uh, our the light of our uh, life, Sabrina Konzok, is not with us today, but we have a, a special, um, a very interesting guest, which is Christian Friedrich. He has been working on, on collaborative and network learning since 2012, and has been hosting podcasts on education, technology, and openness since 2016. He also wrote something. Re recently about um, podcasts and and we want to try to squeeze a little bit out of him how podcasts can be used or are useful, are helpful, uh, are interesting in the concept and in the context of education. Well, and maybe we will also reflect a little bit about ourselves as we have made this first experiment with this, um, with this um, little um, online program and podcast ourselves. And well, let's just start off. Um, Christian, how are you today? Is it um, is it uh, is it the podcast season? Podcast season. Uh, yeah. I think every every time in year is podcast season. That would be my my short answer. No, I'm I'm good. Thanks thanks for inviting me. Glad to glad to be part of this, especially with the last episode now. Yeah. Um, for for now at least, as far as I understand, quite an honor. Thanks for having me. Yeah, like I said, the actual plan was that after having 16 episodes where we were kind of living under COVID, we thought, okay, come on, let's just have one where we're all in the same room. Uh, mm -hmm. All of us here in, in this uh, stream now, we're all in Berlin. Actually, Tino, you're not in Berlin now, but you could have been. But with COVID, it's not possible. So we continue in the old format. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's also great that we've come together. And I just thought, Having done these 16 different podcasts about various things to do with education and something digital, uh, whether it's a topic or a different type of learning or rethinking what universities should be in, in the age of uh, digitalization, I thought, why don't we return to the topic we started with? Why did we come to this idea of podcasts? And we never really thought about it. We never really kind of talked to anyone like you before about, okay, why should we be doing this? And what benefits of it does it have? So that's why we thought it'd be nice to talk to you, Christian. Well, because when you fall in love, you don't ask for reasons. You just do it. I mean, this is the way it is. <laughs> so this is, okay, so this is the description of the series. It's been a process of falling in love, but with what? <laughs> so... How, how was your experience then? Like, what, what did you fall in love with? Um, um, uh, I'm not a, a, prop, a guy who, who enjoys standing probably in front of the stage, but um, the idea of, um, of reflecting together, having listeners, like in the radio, what I also did, is something that I like. I mean, it's a, it's a it's talk, talk, talk radio, let's say, not podcast, talk radio mm. is a beautiful format. And um, uh, it's something that helps you to develop uh, not only the, the idea of communication, how you talk and so on, but also um, the ideas themselves, like Kleist, you know, the development of the thought while talking. Mm -hmm. That is something I like very much of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, Sabrina and I, we've always been describing it as the kind of thing that happens if you go let's say to a conference and then you're just grabbing a coffee between two sessions and then you get to a nice little discussion with someone but it normally then finishes quite quickly afterwards and those kind of things is what we've been able to do I think with uh, with our episodes so we've always had this idea of let's you know when we started this it was the whole point that everyone was because of COVID everyone knew we have to rethink about how we're going to organize learning and stuff But the main thing was, and I know, Christian, you did it, I did it, you know, we all wrote quickly a blog about, right, these are the five things you need to know about digital. And then, you know, so basically everyone was just being overloaded with being pushed, like information was being pushed at them. And also it was the time of like webinars the whole time, like how do you do this? And so we always had this concept, let's totally do an anti-version of that. And so we always said the only thing we want to do in these episodes is start a discussion about something. So in each time, pick a topic and we just want to open it up a bit. And um, so I think 
I mean, I think that's definitely how, how we've enjoyed it. I mean, I've really been the case for me. I I think we I think what we've been doing has a certain value, but it totally has a value for us anyway. Is yeah, that well, something is that something that other people say, Christian? Is that I mean you probably ask that question very often. Um so I think there there are two sides to this, right? So um when my experience has been that when you run a podcast, when you host a podcast, when you try to um find a certain topic for each episode or find a different angle to to a certain topic um it's almost like what what they say about um learning the the best way to learn something is to actually have to explain it to someone so uh having someone asking them questions and then having them in for an interview and then trying to figure out what is left in order for you to understand to grasp the the topic in itself I think that's something that lots of podcasters would describe as their own personal benefit in doing a podcast. Um, and on the other hand, something um, that you said also kind of resonated because especially in this more German scene of podcasting where people don't really care whether your episode will be 20 minutes long or two hours and 20 minutes long, sometimes even twice that, um, lots of people promote the idea of having a podcast where people can listen in while the podcast interview guests or whoever is on there um, are thinking. So actually joining them for that thought process of grasping this topic and, and joining them um, for, for this kind of journey um, because podcasting as an, as an audio podcast at least um, is something that you can do while doing something else. You can you can do it while cleaning, while going for a run. You can do it on your co daily commute or what, whatever you, you wish. Um, and hence, it becomes a kind of different and much more personal and contextual learning experience, to many at least. Not for everyone, doesn't really work for, for everyone, but what well, does, I guess. Um, so, so those are the two things that kind of resonated with what you were saying, I think. And, and lots of podcasters have this experience of um, almost like when you go out for a run on a regular basis. Um, it's been a while for me, but I remember briefly having that feeling of missing it when you stop. Like, and it's almost kind of like that for lots of people who have their kind of interview format and, and podcasts who think that I might need to go out and exercise a bit again. Yeah, actually, I was wondering when uh, we invited you um, if we mm -hmm. would talk about um, how to make a podcast best for listeners, um, mm -hmm. or uh, on the other hand, um, how um, how listeners or how uh, students should make podcasts to learn. So mm -hmm. to, to use the podcast itself as a, as a project to um, uh, to embrace whatever you have mm -hmm. to deal with. So uh, what do you think would be more in, in, in interesting now, or very interesting? I think both are, uh, I think, and I'm, I'm not sure if it's bait, but um, I'll, I'll bite anyway. So I would never go anywhere and say, you should do it like this, or you should have this kind of format. You should aim to do something like this or this or this. Um, but there are maybe some certain, like, let's call it principles of, of how to record something in order for it to sound good. But apart from that, um, Podcasting has plenty of freedom attached to it. So the the idea of um, you just grabbing a microphone and interviewing people, or you and and then I don't know mixing it together in, in some strange way, or you just talking um, for forty five minutes each day, or whatever your podcast idea is, that kind of gives you lots of freedom. And I think we should try and not to impose on that and impose for for people to to change that so if i were um doing a podcast that is uh, and that's where perspectives come in if if i if i have to conceptualize and implement a podcast format that is good for listening and for learning i will always try and ask who the people are that are supposed to be learning whatever it is and whatever it is that they're learning and then i would actually question whether podcasting is the right format for that quite often it is not and also when people 
aim or when students or learners aim to run their own podcast and to to produce their own podcast formats or audio formats to even widen that uh that, yeah. that's bad um I think there are some certain tools where you can say, why don't you use that or that or that? Um, or this hardware device will give you better sound quality. Or if you host it like this, people will actually be able to subscribe to your podcast instead of manually downloading stuff. Um, but apart from that, part of the learning experience then is kind of on this meta literacy level in terms of not only in, in your discipline, but in how to run things and how to how the web works what is an rss feed what is an mp3 versus an wave format or what how do how do repositories works uh how does a repository work in terms of uh versus how spotify works for example how how does that compare to one another and you can make that much more approachable when when students and learners themselves try and run their own formats, I guess. Is this, what, is this what you wrote about in this recent blog about uh, podcasts? <laughs> no, not really. Um, <laughs> what I wrote there is, I was actually, uh, Dominic referred to it, and you referred to it in the introduction as well, I, uh, I think, is a, it, it referred to a workshop I ran with Matthias Stier, who runs a podcast in, in more the, the cultural sphere on museums and in their exhibitions. And um, we offered a workshop um, at the Start Camp in Hamburg last year in September or October, I think, um, that we called You Should Make More Podcasts, Ma Macht mehr Podcasts. Mm. Um, and the idea was that there, there are lots of critics, um, oh, critics um, who claim that this, this, this podcast wave thing should be over by now. So uh, who's going to listen to all that content? Um, what, what, what is the, the sense of this? And this is, this is, this is, this is insane. Why, why should people listen to all the podcasts that everybody produces? And on the other hand, I'm pretty sure there have been these kinds of comments about blogging in, I don't know, 2005 or 2003. And I, I know there have, but I know that we now look back on that and think, That was a silly idea, wasn't it? To to try and keep people from writing on the internet. Now we wish it were back to this, I don't know, 2007 blogging. Let's call it a hype. Um, so the idea in that blog post was basically to um, enable people to, to, on the one hand, make their own podcast, but on the other hand, to also describe what podcasting in learning and education might be good for at least from where I am standing. Yeah. I mean, this is what I find very interesting with the podcast is it's one of those things, firstly, where it seems like it's kind of the rediscovery of the radio somehow, where we all thought somehow that had gone and it definitely hasn't. We can see that's, you know, more and more of things like this are, uh, are popping up on Spotify, where we thought Spotify was just for, you know, well, perfectly produced records and stuff or, you know, music. But um, I really like it because when we often when we're talking about using technology to help education, we always think of the complicated stuff. And this is why I find this really quite an interesting. It's like almost back to a formal format, which is let's just use the voice. I mean, now we're doing it. We're doing it kind of double here where we've got it on YouTube as well, just for fun. But essentially, all this is is a, it's a conversation about something, but it's a way of kind of introducing topics in a very simple format without any without too much thought about what are the didactics behind it and also without necessarily having very complicated kind of technology stuff of course there's a whole load of things now where we've got tools which means we don't really have to think about stuff so when you said you know making sure your feed go appears somewhere that's very easy these days you don't have to think about all this rss stuff but um That's what I'm really interested about is this like we can use technology to kind of go to simple things which actually reach more people. And it I think when I was first thinking of this in an educational setting, I was reminded that uh, me and some colleagues, we were in West Africa last autumn. And there we were talking very much about how local radio is used as a way of getting information out to, to mm -hmm. the population. And it's things like how to use new agricultural techniques and things like this. And essentially, this is kind of the idea here to do that, but with digital education or with really, I think we just were trying to think of like 
how can you rethink education? So we've done it in all different kind of ways. But I think, therefore, the podcast is, is an in, interesting way of kind of, yeah, just, as you say, um, just getting the spoken, out, spoken word out and just kind of stimulating maybe ideas. Yeah, I think it's it's that. And also, um, when I run workshops, uh, uh, mostly in, in higher ed around podcasting and teaching and learning, um, there you can almost count and bet on it that there will be a question of what do you think this should be used for, this format. People, people talking to one another, for example, or me talking as a professor, as a teacher, as an educator for 10 or 15 minutes to somebody else. And... Um, What it's mostly never really good for is the the, the hard facts, the, the the absolute truths. So if you were to, um, I don't know, if you were to explain a mathematic formula or an economic formula um, on a podcast, you most definitely would fail because it's audio audio only. You know, people are doing something else while listening, and so on and so forth. But if you were to take that formula. Or if you were to take that, let's let's stick with the economic formula, for example, of I don't know how. Now you, now you have that's to that. yeah. Now you have now, to name now one. I have to make something up, right? <laughs> um, now you're stuck. So, so let's let's say um, how did the climate uh, not climate crisis? How did the financial crisis and, and then world market crisis in 2008 evolve? And how did it happen? And how did it affect different people? So and there are probably some kinds of formulas to that, or very descriptive analytical things that, I don't know, third semester economy students um, would actually want and would actually have to learn. And a podcast is the worst possible format for them to learn those hard facts. But a podcast is one of the better formats if you are looking to um, give examples, if you're looking to provide context, if you're looking to make this personal. So you have as as we're doing now you, it's easy for you easy-ish to send someone a link who has been affected by the financial crisis in i don't know uh some some country in central africa uh some some country in in north america um australia asia and europe and then compare how the effects trickled down in their in their cases and maybe give an example of how i don't know economic policy in that region actually affected that feeling, that sense. And that's that's what a podcast can really do well in if you give people time to think along and see, ah, I remember that certain economic principle. I can apply it here as well. And the, the interviewer is actually Christian, hinting at it. Christian, we know something. Maybe, maybe mm -hmm. as you have done several podcasts, or especially mm -hmm. um, for or on learning, why don't you give some examples as an example? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, you mean of the podcast that I that I produced myself? Yeah. Um, so there's one. Wait, 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 one, wait, wait, no, mm -hmm. wait, 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 wait. Make it, make a short list of the th <laughs> your three favorites episodes. <laughs> no, a podcast. Well, different podcasts uh, in this area. In this area, okay. So, uh, um, there's one podcast that I really like to listen to that. Um, that you can learn a lot from on, on a like on a meta level. And I just listened to the last episode this this morning, so I might be biased uh, because I'm bringing it up now. It's called The Anthropocene Reviewed. Mm. Um, and I highly recommend it. It's by, of course, I'm not prepared. So it's by an author who apparently Don't. has written some great novels. Don't worry, um, we'll link it underneath. <laughs> nice. And he, he reviews certain aspects of the Anthropocene and that might anything might be anything from I don't know cholera to um, Disneyland and he'll review it and provide some historical context he'll provide a certain cultural lens to it to some extent and then you learn something just by accident you you it's this podcast is not meant for me to learn anything it's main I think it's mainly meant to entertain me but I learn certain things while while listening to this number two and number two a german podcast that is called zeitsprung i don't know if you if you know it it's uh, a podcast where two historians come together to tell each other a story about um history and it's very tiny stories so it might be 
this one eccentric guy who invented, I don't know what, 50 years before Ben Franklin did and how he come disastrously failed with, with something. But listening to that, uh, or him taking the expedition to the North Pole, and listening to that, you learn something about the time the, the story happened, and you learn something about the setting and the scene, um, the, the um, actual power structures and dynamics, but you also learn something about history and how things came about. And then there are different podcasts and I'm, I'm trying to let me let me check on my phone um, <laughs> what's what's it called hold on um, because there are plenty of podcasts that um, go into a very a very specific thing so the the good thing about podcasting is um, or what I try and tell people in in, in the workshops that I run sometimes is uh, very much like blogging you first of all think of an audience of one. Think of yourself as the audience and then see see what comes comes about and um, who actually would like to listen to that. And um, lots of podcasts are doing that in a very interesting way. And let me see if I can find a good one here. So for example, um, it's a German-speaking podcast as well. There's the podcast, I don't know if you know it, it's called Rice and Shine but not rice, but rice. Um, <laughs> and it's actually a, quite a pun because it's by two um, Viet-German uh, journalists who speak about their experience of being, um, uh, of being, of, of having, having a, a family from Vietnam who uh, immigrated to Germany and they're basically second generation living here. So that's a, me being uh, an almost middle-aged white guy, that's that's a perspective I'll never have and I can never actually relive. But um, it's interesting because, of course, they see the world in completely, not completely, but very different nuances than, than I do. And I sometimes, um, I don't want to say I have to force myself to listen to that, but uh, it's it can get quite uncomfortable to to see how they perceive a world in which I am completely fine to wander around and, and see what happens. Um, I'll actually try and find a fourth one. Um, let me see where it is. Um, another one in which I learned a lot as well. And it's, let me see, uh, that's a German one. We actually want to find a, an English speaking one, right? Could um, be good could be good so i think the people at and that's a very different format from from the ones i, I was describing before because that is kind of the the podcasting top notch kind of thing um i don't know if you know the podcast radio lab but most mm. people do who like podcasts and i think not not each episode really captures my interest but if you're um, looking for something that kind of escapes the sphere of the DIY podcasting, that's it. So podcasting where people will actually go with a journalistic question and, and sense into the world and see how they can report on a story and actually take months and months and months to report on a story and then really condense it in this 30, 30 minutes or 40 minutes um, that's quite helpful. Hmm. So, do you think that think, makes a real difference? That's I mm -hmm. think that's a really interesting question. Do you think it makes a difference to have, you know, a really high quality podcast versus one where the sound's not so good and you know it's dropping in and out? Because mm -hmm. very often when you're listening to a podcast, you're anyway you're in the train or you're. You're, you're moving somewhere. So anyway, you haven't got the, at least I don't have like the perfect audio sound anyway. So it, that's kind of interesting. Like, is, is there this quality difference? Does that really make a difference? Is it something that, that every podcast should go for? I think it does. And I think it's, um, uh, and, and I think every podcast should go for it because um, if you, of course, when, when moving around in the train, in the car, on the streets, where, wherever you are, 
uh, there will be background noise and depending on your headphones, depending on your equipment, you will be able to cancel that out or not. Um, but if the podcast, the thing that you're trying to concentrate on itself contains background noise, then it's kind of hard for your brain to figure out what to leave out and what to let in. Um, and also, um, and people, I think, during the, the COVID-19 uh, lockdowns everywhere, people spoke a lot about Zoom fatigue. I don't know if you, you noticed that. And Zoom fatigue, to some extent, has, as far as I understood that research, um, is, is rooted in parts, at least, in the, the main fact that people are trying to um, compensate for the real-life um, carbon-based world interaction that we're trying to simulate on Zoom. Right. And and like gesturing, mimicking, all that kind of stuff that I'm now doing here, and I think the same to some extent goes goes for podcasting. You have you have only like a mouth to ear connection to your people, mm. to your listeners, and that's kind of um, almost an intimate thing sometimes. So people will come up at conferences to me and say, I, "I know we've never met, but I've listened to so many of your podcasts. I kind of." Have, I have an impression of how you tick, what makes you laugh, what makes you, what makes you cringe, and, and, and so on and so forth. And um, this quite personal relationship between people will, at least to my experience, emerge mostly if you try and aim at least for the, the, the best audio quality. Mm -hmm. um, because that um, everything else just is just noise. Mm. Very you see, you see them in it, when you make it <laughs> when you make a cake for your beloved one, you should take care that it looks really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if yeah. you if you make a cake in an oven that keeps on turning on and off, it's quite difficult to make it perfect, which was basically the experience we had with the internet during COVID, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's true that's, too, yeah. Uh looks like we, no, I'm not going to bash products here. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> However, let's 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 go a little bit into the into this uh, education, for, at least for a moment, mm -hmm. into the professional um, um, uh, in the in the in the in the very professional way of using podcasts for education in education. Do you know uh, something about how much is it used? Um, what's its uh, recent development? Can you say something about the context, or are you only a maker and don't care about it? <laughs> um, I do care about the context, and there are probably people who are at least better equipped in terms of research to, to speak on that. Um, and I think it goes very much like, no, uh, bear with me, but uh, I'll try and give an example of why that's a tough question. When people speak about open educational resources, they um, at some point uh, sooner or later, and I'm sure folks at Chiron have made that same experience, they will, uh, be at a certain position where they or someone has to judge whether a resource is actual, uh, actually educational. So who gets to say what is educational and what is, what is not? Who gets to say what is education and what is not? And who gets to say what is learning and what is not? Because those are all quite personal, personal things to do, right? So if, if I learn something and if I want to learn something, then it's kind of my business of whether I perceive that resource as educational for me and my context or not. And that's why I'm always a bit, I'm getting back to the question, um, a bit reluctant to speak about how many percentage points did podcasting gain in education last year or something like that. Because the uh, that only shows that people have podcasting more on their radar and keep it more in terms of whoever made that statistics has podcasting more on their radar and decided this seems to be educational. People must be using this for for learning, right? Um, my sense, though, is that especially during like the, the recent COVID months, people were a bit more aware of podcasting as one outlet, one format um, for learning and education, and that people, like with many things during the last nine, uh, during the last eight or nine months, were a bit more keen to try things out and to see what works and what doesn't. So lots of professors, lots of, lots of educators in higher ed have approached me and said, I run this lecture, it's going full digital now, or it's going hybrid. Um, what can I do to check in with my students? And a podcast, of course, comes to mind, like a, a quick recording of five to 10 minutes. But is that 
learning? Is that educational? A professor or an educator checking in whether their students are okay? Or is that just scaffolding and structure for learning to happen later on? And well, I don't that's know. The right, that's the right rhetorical question to, to follow up on. So when does it become, or when it, does it become per perceived as educational? Mm -hmm. where, are the, where are the moments where they say, oh, yeah, this works? I don't know and I don't care. So as soon as, and I know, I know I'm making it easy for me there, but I really don't care. If, if a university vice president is to say that my recent podcasts are educational and he's now hosting a website uh, on a sub page on, in his digital teaching unit somewhere, fine. If he cares not to, don't. People, um, hopefully, at, especially in, in when, when it comes to, to higher ed, will be able to at least make the, the distinction whether they personally will be learning something with my podcast or anybody else's podcast. Mm. But in terms of a format, it's kind of interesting mm -hmm. because as you say, it's really, of course, it's the living voice. Mm -hmm. And if we think of, you know, the classic idea at the university of the lecture, mm -hmm. that's essentially what it was. You know, of course, these mm -hmm. days you have a PowerPoint behind mm -hmm. you. But originally, and I mean, actually, when I, like, when I was studying as well, like 20 years, oh, longer, 30 years ago, um, <laughs> um, it was also like that. So that's kind of interesting. So is it the case that, um, that there is something that says if you've got kind of less distractions and it's much more like the living voice and the person who's delivering this message has to think much more about how they're shaping it into you know what we say in German, this kind of this red line that has to go through what you want to say, even if it's scientific. Maybe there's something about that 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 works that that we we're, we're all trying to do with the podcast as well. I think so. Yeah, um, I think with um, the the strangest things happen sometimes when you run podcasting workshops. So uh, one basic question that people will always ask me is, what is the ideal length of a podcast episode? Is it, I read that it's supposed to be 15 minutes and probably Bitcom somewhere published that mm. um, because then it's still marketable. Then you can still monetize at some point and include an advertisement here and there. Um, and the what, what people in online video for learning do quite often is they will say, if your YouTube video is longer than, I don't know what the current stat is, five minutes or and 30 seconds or three minutes and 30 seconds, what, whatever somebody came up with in some kind of study, this is, this is the ideal length for an online video uh, if you want to make it for learning. Um, and I agree because if you're sitting in, in front of your computer, you're, um, you're watching a YouTube lecture or a, a YouTube video, And there, at least for me personally, there's always this, I have to restrain myself from opening another tab while I still listen to the YouTube video to check what the weather is going to be, what the news are, what Twitter is doing, or what, I don't know, some sports site is doing. Mm -hmm. And with podcasting by design, um, you have a format that is meant for people to listen to while doing something else. You're supposed to download this on your device and then walk around, or you're supposed to stream it and, I don't know, clean your bathroom. And um, that kind of limits the format for learning to some extent because you can't really take notes. I, I would never produce a podcast where I expect people to take notes or put down a link or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but that also gives me, as a podcaster, it gives me the chance to... Um, show how certain thoughts can evolve, for example. So that gives me the chance to invite somebody who talks about, let's say, um, as, uh, as asymmetries in how people have access to education. You can put lots of bullet points down on, a, on a, like an A4 mm -hmm. uh, letter page, or you can talk about that for 30 or 45 minutes and try and connect to person to a person's own personal experiences and that kind of is the learning effect i'm not sure if that makes a podcast an educational resource though because an educational resource at least some would say is kind of has been instructionally designed and i'm not sure if a podcast that kind of 
where this kind of structure emerges emerges almost organically mm. fits that idea of instructional design for example but this is i think why i find it so interesting because i mean mm -hmm. we a, a bit like what you were saying we just need to relax a bit about some of these things <laughs> And it's also because for me, the learning space is much bigger than we as educators think it is. You know, there's, I think this is to your point as well. You know, we're, mm -hmm. basically we're all going around learning all the time while we're doing other things. So, but according to education in the kind of the, you know, the very, very traditional way, you're not learning unless somebody tells you this is learning. Mm -hmm. and, 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 then, and then exactly following on for that, it's like, okay, if it's got to be learning, it needs to write instructional design behind it. But what we often, and, and this is a really, for me, this is always an interesting question when we talk about any kind of digital format, because we're already then offering learning in a kind of a virtual space, which we don't really understand. So the person is in a physical space, mm -hmm. but something's happening in a virtual space as well. And then often, though, when you design this space, you're not considering all of these pieces together. And, you know, this is something that uh, you, you often hear also from, from um, when, when you talk about people, about, uh, talk to people about uh, designing a space and they'll say, yeah, I've got this great uh, tool for the students to communicate on the website, but they all use WhatsApp. So, but that's, that's because for them, there's no difference. They're already in the, the space which includes WhatsApp. It's this, Kind of concept which is from david white called digital literacy uh, did, sorry digital residency yeah. this is that you're residing in a much bigger space than the educationalists often mm -hmm. think and i just think this is drop in and drop out. exactly and i think this is kind of an interesting way of thinking of especially in in digital where we mm -hmm. always we often get a bit of a hang-up about trying to design that space then perfectly and then and just measuring. Yeah, and then and, and, and measuring, but you're also measuring, you're not measuring the whole thing because you're only measuring the thing you think uh, Dominic, is the space. You know, there's mm -hmm. some, some questions I still have. I mean, what I always was wondering, is podcaster a job? And what kind of jobs are you doing or are you offering? Uh, are the podcasts uh, in... in, in uh, uh, Fried, uh, Christian, how, mm -hmm. how is that? What, what, what is your job? I mean... Um, Depends. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you have Depends. been doing workshops on education. Now you're a little bit um, um, refusing mm -hmm. to, to say the educational cannot be defined. But apparently there are um, contexts where you can work and yeah. where you can do Definitely. good stuff. So um, wh what did you do and what, what do you do now? Um, so over the last couple of years, I've always worked with mostly higher ed institutions, but also NGOs for profits. Um, when it came to questions around connected learning experiences. So how do people in networks learn and collaborate in order to um, produce or share knowledge, basically? Um, and part of that is actually sometimes podcasting, because sometimes, um, as you probably know, knowledge management within an organization, for example, can be the stuff that nobody really wants to do. You're not going to document how your process works because X, Y, Z. Um, but if you are to walk around with a microphone in your hand and you ask people in bookkeeping or people in personal development or people in some kind of administrational sphere and they actually get to talk about their job and their processes into a mic, then they will actually kind of do knowledge management without even noticing to some extent. Um, nice. the, the, the other thing is um, what I was just talking about, context. So um, as a professor, you're used to explaining economic theory, for example, or mathematics or whatever it is. But if you were to run into somebody who interviews you, um, not even in a very journalistic way, but just tries to take over the perspective of the learner and ask questions and, and see where that takes them, that might help both the professor get better at explaining what it is that she does in, in terms of like, you have two minutes, ask any academic in the world and let them explain to you their field of study, their field of expertise in 90 seconds and see, see how, how far they, they came 
how, how far how far they actually were able to to take you along on that journey and then compare what what actually stuck with you and how they would react tina and, always says that to me when we whenever mm -hmm. he does some because well he always mm -hmm. works as a journalist and then mm -hmm. he'll ask me a question i'll answer and he's like no that's too complicated yeah <laughs> that's <laughs> exactly the point and so uh, having running a podcast with a professor, for example, or an educator or a scientist um, can be on that meta level, not even about the very podcast episode that you're producing, but it might just trigger this thought in the professor's head when they listen back to what they came up with. I think I need to explain this better. I think I need to get better at communicating what it is that I do. Um, and to get a little bit closer to the question. So I consulted with organizations and, and people, and I still do, who want to create some kind of networked learning experience. And part of that job sometimes is to run or to host or to facilitate podcasting. And I run workshops. I consult with individuals who want to create their own podcasts. Um, I sometimes offer to produce podcasts, to, so to conceptualize, um, name, produce, um, do the editing, the, the mixing, everything, and then publish. So I'm almost, sometimes I'm like a small publishing house and sometimes I'm just the guy you call when you run into a technical problem. Hmm. So that's kind of the spectrum. Yeah, that's the new times. Um, uh, the, the radio and the TV um, as the pre prefabricated format of um, mass communication lose ground and uh, or become become only the medium for a certain part of the population while uh, more and more people especially those who are um, uh, skilled with more than long more language and who move around in the world um, choose to um, uh, to to pick their own um, uh, sources of information mm -hmm. and entertainment which must not necessarily always lead into um, ideological bubbles but it can and, but it's and very interesting because um, this, um, as we, we had discussed with Dominic about the fact that the universities are old and even if they want to renew themselves, which is very good, um, they cannot think about it without themselves as the reference. And, um, and I think um, uh, it's necessary because the university is just a big school, you know, because the school is school. A school cannot be cannot be substituted because it is a, is a human um, direct relationship. But um, there are so many happening outside. Um, <clears throat> Stefan Zweig wrote in his bi um, biography that in school it was totally boring and nothing, you were not worth nothing, but everything interesting happened outside. They had terrariums, they, had, they were interested about the latest cultural news from Vienna, Berlin and Paris. Um, they did their, um, their cultural... Um, um, development by themselves outside school so um, and now this outside school has become something more i don't know if this talking to many strangers is exactly the thing that makes the world better but i don't know what do you think about it i mean historically what what do you think this um, proliferation of individual um, communication formats what what do, does it mean in your in your um, do you ever think about it sure but i think that people in the one podcast that I host with together with Marcus Diamond, we just recently let me let me look it up what the, the title was. I'll find it really quick. Um, we had a an article that we featured and that we spoke about called um, The Sisyphean Cycle of Technology Panics by Amy Orban. I can send you a link for, for the show notes if you're interested. Yes, um, and it's basically looked at this historical it took this historical stance and took a look at how new technological developments are received and then everybody panics and then parts of it are implemented then new technology technological development like a cycle everybody panics oh we have to renew everything that we have we have to renew everything that we see uh, it was the same with books it was the same with radio it was the same with tv and it's um now has been the same for the last 20 or 30 years, every once in a while, maybe even 40 years with the internet. Um, and people always cry and cry and cry. The university, this old structure um, has to renew itself and it can't do it on their own, uh, on its own. Um, people will have to, the people will have to destruct it and demolish it. And, and uh, then we'll build a new system that uh, actually cares for, for what, 
what we should edu what education should look like and um i'm only i i hope you can sense that i'm kind of reluctant to accept that narrative <laughs> um because the people who talk about this and you just you quoted uh, stefan zweig and i'm i'm sure he he was an intellectual like mastermind sure but the those are not the people that universities are built for. Those are the kind of people who would usually get along and be educated and learn, and they don't need a university to do that. Um, those are the kinds of privileged people that I don't need to care about, that you don't need to care about, because they will get along anyways. We should care about what they do and how they do it, and we should s scaffold learning for them as well, sure. But the university or any kind of educational institution, at least from, from where I stand, that as someone who likes to keep things publicly owned and not privatized, I think they should take care of society as a whole or as much of society as they possibly can. And looking to people like, I don't know, recently there, there has been, what's uh, Frank Thielen, I think is his mm -hmm. name. The, um, in, in Germany, there's a, there the, the seems to be a TV show. Yeah, like the, the, the Lions, what's it called? Lions Cage? Lions Den. Den. Lions Den, yeah. Yeah. And he's one of those um, investors who got rich by, I don't know, investing in some, some kind of internet company, probably in the late 90s, or early 2000s. And, and now he's making claims about education. People should learn, like kids should learn or must learn to think like Elon Musk. These are not the kind of people that I want to listen to when I think about education. And um, I think to them, the university structure should be demolished demolished and like in some schumpeterian way be destructed and then rebuilt but these are not the kind of people that i want to care for when i speak about public education i should make probably that that distinction so the 80 percent and i think there's a large percentile in society for whom the university or a higher ed institution works to some degree probably not perfect but to some degree it works there's a reason why people who already have two or three doctorate degrees say don't ever worry about getting a doctorate degree um, when you apply at i don't know bcg or mckinsey they don't really care for that anymore um, by the way i have my three degrees already and my yeah. my rent is safe as well so i'm always quite cautious when people claim that something should be destructed uh, when it's actually a public good that they're speaking about. But I, th I think with, uh, I think I agree with your principles, but not with your argument, because <laughs> I'm a super fan of higher education, of course, and, mm -hmm. and public higher education. Um, I, you know, I work in that. I'm, I'm part of it myself. But I think the problem with formal education of any sort is it, it's to, it, it creates an environment which it thinks it's controlling and therefore it's not really reflecting the environment we're all living in. So this is why, you know, this is one of the big goals, I think, for, for Kiron that we really reach out to the world the students are actually in. Um, mm -hmm. And this is why I think formats such as uh, podcasts and things like that are very interesting because it's just, as you say, it's new ways of talking about things in maybe anecdotal formats which yeah. is then you know it's, it's a way of like picking up people maybe who otherwise would say no that's just nothing for me you know um, and so I, th I think that's that's the interesting point I totally don't agree that um, universities should be destroyed and you know this whole kind of you know this uh, this as you say this Schumpe this you know Schumpetian idea is 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 it's also wrong for education. It doesn't work for education. But there's a, a tendency in uh, education to be rather relaxed so about this kind of, mm -hmm. yeah, we just say, no, this is how it always has been. Yeah. It's successful. And really, the interesting thing for me is even if you think of someone who's been through kind of the formal education system and has been relatively successful, and let's say they finish um, their formal education, therefore at 25, 27. Nowadays, you can probably talk of most people living to 100. What happens in all the rest of the time? And the education system often says, no, that's not, that's nothing to do with me. So Definitely. there you can already see this thing. And, you know, this was really nice. We had a, a one of the podcasts we have was the 60 year curriculum. And I think this is these kind of ideas. And it just means you have to open up to these other types of format. Yeah, and that's yeah. where like, um, who was it who said 
lifelong learning seem, almost sounds like a lifelong sentence yeah like it's it's like being sent to to jail until you're 99 and then you uh, yeah you're allowed to stop learning and i do think like podcasting to like circle back maybe to 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 the original topics kind of i do think podcasting can play like a, a very small percentile role in renewing some of these institutions or some of these ways of perceiving learning because the discussion we had earlier like what is perceived as learning what is perceived as education um what is actually being adapted by higher ed at this moment so next week i think or the week after i'm traveling uh um, i'll be taking the train and going to hagen to visit the Fernuniversität, uh, the the distance university, like the institution in Germany who does distance edu that does distance education, and I think I'm running the third or fourth podcasting workshop there. And this is like the most traditional way of thinking about distance education in terms of what you said, Dominic, like this command and control thing. I mm. control whether you have learned this, and I yeah. can check that box. And now you get to move on in your life. Thanks very much. And they're now thinking about doing podcasts um, in different kinds of formats. So that kind of narrative that the university itself would not be able to renew to some extent is weirdly off to me, at least. Like over the last 40 years, universities have changed quite a bit. Well, absolutely. And then we have we have we have accompanied this development uh, from mm -hmm. uh, from a long time ago already. And now I would also try to um, to come back to the very beginning mm -hmm. of our um, last uh, episode here. So um, 17 times, um, um, Dominic, we did this thing here now. So what's your uh, what's your feeling about it? My feeling, my feeling yeah. is. Firstly, to follow up on what Christian said, everyone should make a podcast. Um, it's a great way of having a, a very simple excuse to have a long chat with people who you'd probably be thinking it would be really cool to chat with them for 45 mm -hmm. minutes. So that's, I think, a, a big thing. And for me, it's just been, it's been really great to just like look at all these different dimensions of education, which really interest me and just have a chat about them. And um, so I, th I think it was good. I think it was funny as well. Uh, we had a whole load of uh, challenges. And, um, but I was thinking the other day, my best story of the whole series was your pigeon story, Tina. Yeah, my pigeon story. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yeah, if, 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 um, if COVID would have um, destroyed humanity, Uh, this pigeon would have taken uh, my house in a, in a flat. <laughs> the pigeon was basically taking over his whole... It was beginning with your flat, wasn't it? But it was... Yes, it, is, it was making a nest after I was absent only three days. So, uh, <laughs> in a little window, you know. Very, very beautiful. That's to your yeah. thing, Christian, with the Anthropocene world, mm -hmm. the pigeon is going to rule. Anthropocene reviewed. Yeah. Highly recommend that podcast. <laughs> well, Christian, that's really interesting. I'm really looking forward to, um, uh, to talk with you again um, mm -hmm. as we are trying to, to develop a podcast studio in Berlin. You have a lot of experience. And uh, next time, um, uh, Dominic, you come to Berlin, please uh, tell me before. Otherwise, I will not do a podcast with you anymore. <laughs> okay. So uh, yeah, that would be good. Well, I would say this is a is a nice um, nice moment to finish. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to thank you, Christian, uh, for being with us. Sure. Just, um, I learned a lot sure. oh, in just these few minutes, and um, we will we will think about a new format, a new um, a new launch of something um, where we will compete with Lightbig and I, and then we'll see and we'll let you know. Yeah. 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 Sure. Do let me know. And thank you to everyone else who kind of joined us on this journey. And uh, sorry that Sabrina couldn't be here today. She's stuck in the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe next time. But that's actually, uh, for, for me, just one closing remark. I think sure. if, if I'm allowed, I think what, what I would really like to see people sometimes ask me, like two or three years ago, people asked me what, what open What, what I would want open to to aspire to and I think the same goes to podcasting as well is to have more people who don't look like the three of us run a podcast and see see what happens then um, 
So anybody who is thinking about running a podcast um, or has has a certain idea, please, please do put that out there and uh, let us all listen to that. I'd be interested. Totally. Back to the beginning. So as mm -hmm. Christian said in his, pod, in his blog in January, go out and make podcasts. That's it. <laughs> Thanks right. very much. Thank you very much. Goodbye.